Uh, this is actually well, the, the, the nicest thing, one of the nice things about our January meetings, we get to tell you, this is we celebrate our 23rd year here in the community. Uh, last 12 is Thelma McMillan, but before then we were just Torrance Memorial Drug and Alcohol Program. So we've helped thousands of people over those 23 years. And, uh, you know, it's thanks to many of you in the audience here. You know, thanks for your support. Uh, how many are here for the first time at one of our meetings? Okay, it's not too many, but thank you and welcome. Uh, how many of you are, I always like to have the speaker have a, a good idea of what his audience is. How many are mental health professionals, psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists? Okay, the vast majority, substance abuse or chemical dependency, counselors, EAPs, physicians, great. How many of you, here's a hard question, how many of you have you ever used Thel McMillan services? Okay, well, not too many. Good, then we're gonna let you know about it. <laughs> For those of you that have, uh, we thank you. And uh, for those of you that haven't, we need to know, you know, one of the things we'd love to know is how to gain your support and confidence. Uh, you know, as I said, 23 years here and the quality and success of our program is really, we have a beautiful facility right across the hall, across the parking lot, I mean, which you can make an appointment to visit and we have great experience, but the real quality and, and the excellence of our program is our staff and many of them are with us for 10, 12, 15, and more than 20 years. Actually, we have very, very little turnover. So if they come up, let me just introduce the few that are here. Uh, Kathy Donahue is our relatively new outreach coordinator. We took Herb Kagan's place, and Herb's here. Hello, Herb. Uh, we have Therese Lang is our uh, intake specialist. So she actually handles, if you call and you have any referral of any sort or any question, <laughs> Therese will be the one that handles uh, all of your concerns. And then our program director is Dr. Donnie Watson. And uh, he runs our day-to-day program. We see another staff member coming in. Our, we have a full-time nurse on our program, Katie. Hello, in the back. So if you have any questions about our program during any of the time, feel free to speak to any of them. Uh, at the beginning of the year, I also, thank you, I appreciate that. Actually, they deserve more than that. Thank you. I, you're right. Uh, you know, it's really, like I said, we have almost no turnover in our program. I mean, sometimes people move or leave, but, but and, and that's a testament to just how hard everybody works and how great they are and, and how dedicated, uh, you know, the staff is. Uh, since it's the beginning of the year, I want to just tell you a little bit about our program. It's an IOP, which is an intensive outpatient program. We have an adult program and a teen program. The adult program is nine months in length. The teen program is six months to, to complete and a year to graduate. <coughs> Uh, and it's the basic 12-step in cognitive behavior therapy, group therapy, family, individual relapse prevention, mindfulness, meditation. Uh, it begins with an initial no-cost no assessment. And uh, I say this all the time, you know, I'm, I'm proud to be part of Torrance Memorial Hospital, which is a great hospital. Uh, and they're committed to only doing the right and the best thing. And for 23 years of doing this, all they've asked us to do is make sure we take care of the people that come here. So the initial assessment is no charge. We don't, we work closely with the referring uh, provider. And if a person is not appropriate for our program, about 40% get referred either to psychiatry, psychology, AA, or an inpatient program. Uh, we accept most insurances. We have, we, we rarely turn anybody away who's motivated for uh, financial reasons. Uh, A few words about it. IOP. You know, and some people think that an outpatient program is actually less than. You know, it's the it's the lesser alternative to a more important and, and, and a better residential program. But you know, actually, that's not the case. When it's appropriate, it's actually the preferred treatment of choice. Uh, some of the reasons people get sober in their own community. We do a lot of work with people who go to the best treatment programs in the country. But when they are done, whether it's 30, 60, 90, or more days, they have to come home. And so oftentimes they'll come to our program and do our entire program because they'll have a year of support. Uh, other, other advantages, they develop, you develop your 12-step community 
and support system right from day one. Uh, you learn how to handle real life daily triggers. You get to stay at work and school. There's increased family involvement in, a, in an IOP. Uh, one of the, it's extremely cost effective. You know, a year in our program costs six thousand dollars, of which most of it is covered by insurance. You know, compare that to twenty-five, thirty to fifty thousand a month in some of the uh, higher end programs. Uh, we have a strong five hundred person uh, alumni group, so you always have somebody you can depend on and rely on. If you go to 12-step meetings in the community, you're going to always run into many, many Thelma graduates. Uh, so in addition to our treatment programs, so we have, like I said, about half of what we do is community outreach, which includes these kind of lecture series. Uh, what I'd like you to make sure you do is go on our website, which is thelmacmillancenter.com and uh, take a look at what we have, take a look at the upcoming lectures and talks and so on. Also, we have a resource center, and it's important for two reasons. The community resource center uh, lets people know what's going on in the community that's related to substance abuse and, and addiction and so on. But if you're a professional and you have something you want the community to know about, then go online, there's a section for professionals, Put you know, fill out the forms that have, uh, that let you, We'll post what you're doing and allow the community to become aware of it. So again, really important. Uh, to make it, we, we have in the back material, there's a community uh, table for material, there's our table. We have referral pads that look like this. And I'd like you to take one if you want. But it really helps you kind of focus, there's lots of information on this for how to focus whether a person needs to be referred for an assessment or not. And by the way, when I say referral, keep in mind, you know, probably half the, half the inquiries we get are from family members who are calling and saying they need some help with somebody else in their family to get clean and sober. And we work closely with them as well. Uh, <clears throat> so one last thing, there's a flyer in the back. There's an upcoming uh, conference, which I'd like you to be aware of. Thel McMillan is the a uh, key sponsor for it, it's the Evolution of Addiction Conference on February 5th to 8th at the, I uh, forgot which hotel it is, but it's down by the airport. Great three-day conference with some of the top speakers in the country. Uh, and if you want to take a flyer, there's even a discount on that flyer. A uh, couple of housekeeping items. Now would be a good time to turn off your cell phone uh, or silence it. Uh, if you have CEUs on the way out, pick up your CEU certificate and or filling out whatever form needs to be filled out. Uh, Dr. Smith will take a break in the mean, probably somewhere in the middle and you can, you know, have a 10 or 15 minute break. But if you need to use the restrooms, they're over to the right at any time. And with that, let me introduce Dr. Smith, our speaker. Now I'm gonna give you a long introduction. And normally we cut this down, but I want you to know Dr. Smith traveled over 3,000 miles to be here, all the way from Washington, DC, just for this talk, by the way. So we are incredibly appreciative of that. So let me read you his uh, information here. Ron Smith, upon graduating graduation from um, Amarillo High School, enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. He was soon after appointed to the United States Naval Academy, graduating with the class of 1966. He attended the University of Texas Medical School and completed an internal medicine residency at the Mayo Graduate School of Medicine and Naval Hospital in San Diego. Dr. Smith was the first physician trained in critical care medicine by the U.S. Navy, completing his fellowship at the University of Southern California Center for the Critically Ill in Los Angeles in 1976. <clears throat> he soon became one of the first physicians involved in Navy alcohol treatment and with Captain Joe Persh was instrumental in the founding of the Betty Ford Center. As I said, I'm gonna read more, but I want you to listen. You know, we have somebody who has been in this field for a long time, really one of the pioneers in this field. <coughs> He left the Navy in 1978, and as a civilian, Dr. Smith founded the Emergency Medicine Residency Program at Loma Linda University Medical School. During this time, he and his brother Richard Smith worked together to start the Winners Foundation, which offered free substance abuse treatment at Santa Anita and other racetracks in the thoroughbred racing industry throughout the world. His interest in addiction and recovery led to an interest in the psychological growth during the middle and mature years of life, which led him to complete a psychiatry training at Loma Linda, where he also taught emergency and critical care medicine. He returned to active duty in 1992 as a psychoanalyst 
and contributed as medical consultant for the Honorable Jim Ramstead for the Ramstead Wellstone Bill, which was eventually passed in 2008 as the Parity Act. So he's one of the founders of the Mental Health Parity Act. Uh, as an emergency physician, he accompanied Senator Arlen Specter traveling on his worldwide congressional delegations. Senator Specter enabled Dr. Smith to meet many world leaders and contribute significantly as a political psychologist. Dr. Ronald Smith is board certified in internal medicine, emergency medicine, psychiatry, and addiction medicine. He completed his psychoanalytic training at the Southern California Psychoanalytic Institute in Beverly Hills and has a doctorate of philosophy in psychoanalysis. Since 2002, he has been annually recognized by the Consumer Research Council as one of America's top psychiatrists in psychoanal psychoanalysis and alcoholism. Ron is married to Dr. Anita Alexander Gaddius Smith, an accomplished author and practicing psychologist in Washington, D.C., with three children and six grandchildren. Ron will continue his interest in political psychiatry. He will work in private practice and continue to lobby for the treatment of our homeless and mentally ill in hospitals instead of jails, for decriminalization of addiction, and for NCAA playoffs on the field, which we have. <laughs> he will also continue his quest for a Kentucky Derby winner. So let me, let me introduce to you Dr. Ronald Smith, and we're pleased to have him. Thank you guys for coming out. Um, and spending some, no, no, I just did the wrong one here, okay. I'm challenged, I used to be important and I'm not anymore, so I don't know how to do this. Um, okay, can you hear me? Oh good, okay. Uh, well thank you for coming out and um, spending some time with me talking about trauma and how much life hurts and how we deal with it, and that's kind of the, the short version. I was glad to hear um, Mo talk about the program here and intensive outpatient treatment. Uh, the numbers are actually a little more favorable for IOP. I was part of the parity bill, and which started on a napkin at Morton's in Georgetown, if you know, want that. Uh, but we finally got it through. You know the way that it, the parity bill passed? It was in the Troubled Asset Relief uh, Program that was the last one that Jim, Jim Ramstead signed. Uh, and they, they put it on as a tag. So if your insurance is better, it's because of the tr Troubled Asset Relief uh, Program, which uh, got in trouble. It's another talk another time. Um, I'm, I'm from Washington, and I'm here to help you. Uh, if, if, <laughs> If you think it's bad here, um, it's, uh, I, I really I have uh, seriously have watched. I've, I've spent the last 20 years of my life in the Middle East and in, uh, in the Senate and House and, and in the Pentagon and watched everything come apart. So if some sadness and confusion comes up, uh, forgive me for it. I'm sad and confused uh, is the reason for that. Um, Intensive outpatient uh, treatment, $6,000 is a steal. Uh, the average alcoholic affects the lives of seven people, and we don't even know the cost. We don't look at the ADD and the rest of the stuff, and that's a, another thing. But, but that's a great program, and this is a great program, and I just want to affirm the work you're doing. And uh, uh, there's no reason. Sometimes you have to get in the hotel business, but when you don't have to, uh, to treat it and, and have... Uh, uh, people get well. It's it's a great value for the culture at every level. So I applaud your uh, sincere. This is where the rubber meets the road, and all of the stuff we write in Washington uh, is so irrelevant at one level. But I hope you're getting paid for some of that because that's a, a steal for the government. Well, I I keep doing the wrong thing here. Uh, how 12 steps heal PTSD and addiction. That's what we're going to talk. And this is what happened to me. Now, I should say up front that uh, I have been through four wars by my value system we shouldn't have been in. Uh, Vietnam, Gulf War I and II, and Afghanistan. I went back on active duty because of Gulf War I. 
Um, and that's another thing. If my story gets in and I get political comments in here, forgive me. All I know is my life experience and, and uh, I'll um, <laughs> ask up front forgiveness. My observation is the Marines, and my practice was primarily Marines, although the, when it became Walter Reed Medical Center at Bethesda, it was Army and everyone else. Marines with PTSD who drink enough to get to AA, the ones with real PTSD who drink enough to get to AA and get sober and keep going to meetings, so a lot has to happen. They do well with PTSD. And I've watched this from Vietnam, Gulf War I and II, Afghanistan, and it's been fairly consistent. Now, the story today I'm going to tell is how and why I think that happens, and I don't know. I, I came out of critical care and emergency medicine, and I love that. When somebody quit breathing, you breathe for them. If their heart quits, you put a pacemaker in. I love psychiatry and therapy because we don't know what the hell we're doing. <laughs> and and I don't think that's bad. I think it's fun and interesting, and I, I do think we have to kind of acknowledge that, that we're lost with this, particularly with PTSD. But uh, what, what we'll try to do is tell a story about why these guys get better. Uh, I love this about Wittgenstein, was the only man who looked puzzled at his own lectures. For this, I think very well of him indeed. But, <laughs> so if I looked puzzled, I'd... I'll, uh, Diseases, and Kathy Tunney, who's a close personal friend, I adore her, and I, we love each other a lot, and have known each other for a long time. Uh, both know a guy named Dr. Joe Persh, and you'll see his picture a little bit. But he describes addiction as a disease of the ability to relate to people. And it's also true, I think, with PTSD. And that's where it kind of will come together, I hope. Both of them are failures of intimacy at one level and failures of basic trust. Disease of the ability to relate to others, deficits of joy in spontaneity. And you can, uh, this new film, I haven't seen it, about the, the American sniper. I think that, that they show that well, the lack of the spontaneity. Uh, a deficit of autonomy, deficit of agency. Now you got them in the most of the folks I know, and I've been, I've got PTSD. So, uh, and and there is something about being in a critical care unit or an emergency room or in Afghanistan. I get real calm. I'm not anxious or fearful. I'm fine. But coming back home is kind of problem for me. Are we gonna? And, and are we going to stop war? No, probably not. And this is Freud. I don't think we can improve on that. It's a general principle that conflicts of interest between men are settled by the use of violence. This is true of the whole animal kingdom from which business men have no business to exclude themselves. Now, that's, that's just what Freud said. And certainly in my lifetime, it hadn't gone away. I want to talk to you. I, I'm <clears throat> going to just veer off for a little, little while and tell you wh what the influences were on me because you have a right to know that. You have a right to know my biases. And this is an interesting thing for those of you. Some, some of you are about midlife. Some of you much younger. Some, not, I think I'm the oldest guy in the room. But to sit down and see how the world has influenced you and to do this. And these are some of the folks that influence me. I'm, pardon me, I'm going to take my coat off because it's a little warm up here. It's so, so nice to be in California. <laughs> this is uh, my emotional, uh, I've got three emotional fathers that will come up here. James Forrestal, does anybody know James Forrestal? He was the first Secretary of War. He um, was the guy that they wrote the book The Great Gatsby about. He was the fictional character. And Magic Man, there were actually three novels about him, recent film about him. But yeah, Forstall was uh, Secretary of Navy. He's Secretary of War. He made, uh, he was uh, chairman of Dylan Reed, the bond trading house in Wall Street. He made about $9 million in 1929. Didn't, money did nothing for him, but he loved war. He is the one that 
during World War II could pick up the phone and say, Henry Ford, you remember when I loaned you $100 billion for to build that plant? I need 100 planes. And he could, with the phone, he also loved it. He really hit his uh, stride there. He also had undiagnosed alcoholism after the end of the war, became psychotic. Never got diagnosed. He got uh, admitted right up there to the presidential suite. He tried to jump out of the limousine on the way to the hospital. This is the National Naval Medical Center. It's called the President's Hospital. It's in Bethesda. It's where I've worked for 22 years. But Harry Truman called down and said, how's my Secretary of War? And he said, well, and the guy who had my job, actually, Captain Rain, said, well, he's doing okay, Mr. President. He's down in the quiet room. We've taken away his shoes and his shoelaces and the usual stuff we do for Susan. And the President said, Captain, I do not want my Secretary of War down there with those crazy people. You put him up in the, pres in the presidential suite. He said, and, and Captain Rain said, Mr. President, he's seriously suicidal. I object to that. And I'm going to write a memo for the name. Harry Truman said, I don't care what you think you put him up there and you put somebody to watch him and I don't need to tell you what happened then he was up there and it was a Sunday night and the corpsman who was watching him the Secretary of War said go get me something to eat and he said I'm not supposed to leave you he said I don't care I'm the Secretary of Defense you do it and he the uh, corpsman went and he jumped from this to this and died undiagnosed alcoholism this is another talk another time, but I'll do a little sales pitch for it. That the McCarthy hearings, Senator Joe McCarthy, during the hearings on most Thursday night, were admitted to Bethesda Hospital and put up on this floor, given Thorazine to go to sleep. On Sunday night, they gave him amphetamines to wake up so he could go back to the hearings for the McCarthy hearings. That's essentially undiagnosed alcoholic paranoia. It's a complication called Korsakoff syndrome. Has anybody heard that? Confabulation. He said oh, there are 120 communists in the State Department. And the press was writing it down. Nobody questioned it. It's Korsakoff syndrome. He's just making stuff up. But the culture's paranoia at that time was willing to believe it. It's, uh, that's a whole, anybody that's in a program wants to do a PhD thesis, the influence of undiagnosed, uh, untreated alcoholism on our national policy is astonishing. Okay, this is a little bit too far. This, yeah, any comments or anything, it's lonely up here. And <laughs> this is the USS Forrestal. This is the way I got brought into the, treatment business. Do you recognize this? This is a, one of the most famous accidents, aviation, maybe the most famous aviation accident in the military. This is USS Forrestal on the line launching planes to go to Hanoi. There's an interesting guy right there. His, that's a, these are A-4s. Those are attack aircraft. And that's an A-4 that got hit with a Zuni missile. The pilot of that plane was a guy named John McCain. There's John McCain. He was my, I had one flight with him when I was a midshipman. This is the fire. Nearly destroyed the carrier. Because it was an aviation accident and because the, it was a ship of the line at war, they did a very careful study and made everybody that was on the deck pee and looked at the urine to see if there were any drugs in it. And guess what? 35% were positive for opiates, marijuana, or alcohol. At this time, the United States Navy became very concerned about having sober guys <laughs> in these planes and sober people loading the Zuni missiles and sober people doing the 500-pound bombs on deck. So we got very interested in the treatment business for alcoholism and developed something called zero tolerance. Now you didn't have to go to treatment. You could leave the Navy, but when they when I went to treatment in 1976, they didn't ask my opinion about whether I needed treatment or not. They said get in a truck. That was the intervention in the Navy. 
the, if you ever think about it, it's the only disease we have that we ask a sick organ to, well, let me decide what's good for me. <laughs> and the brilliance of the Navy was we didn't, we didn't ask that. They say, no, you get in the truck, you're going to go to these meetings. And I, in my lifetime, have made a lot of scary walks in and out of uh, Ramallah. We were on our way to meet Benazir Bhutto when she got blown up in Islamabad. The scariest walk I ever made was from a white Navy van into an AA meeting. I don't know what that's about, but we'll try to talk a little bit about it. This is, um, uh, as I said, the USS Forrestal, and they fought that fire heroically. 167 sailors died. This was in October, this was in uh, the, actually the 29th of January, 1976, 1967, sorry. 20, 29 July, yeah, 67. And John got shot down in two months later and spent the rest of his time in the Hanoi Hilton. This is the Hanoi Hilton. That's, that's uh, you recognize this balding, aging. There's John McCain, Stockdale. This is a picture right outside. This is his cell, one aspect in the Hanoi Hilton. And I was an internal medicine resident when they released these guys from the Hanoi Hilton. So I've been looking at PTSD. For John, Senator McCain's not my patient, and I know him, but I'm not talking about patients now. But I'm talking about the people, the people with PTSD and, and that have contributed to the world having it. And this is, do this sometime with you. Just, just get one of these things. And when I was in Amarillo uh, in the 60s, um, you know, growing up kind of in a Lonesome Dove movie. Uh, but I, I, I can remember Khrushchev, and I don't know if any of you remember him. Do you remember Khrushchev at the United Nations banging on the podium with his shoe, saying, we will bury you. And I'm an angry teenage son of an alcoholic, furious with authority figures. And what did I do? They screw you, oh man, I'll kill you. And I joined the Marine Corps. That's why it's important for leaders of the country not to say, bring them on. Because guess what? There's other 16 and 17 year old angry guys out there that'll do it. You can't call ISIS the junior varsity. Why? Because they're petulant, pissed off, angry, hurt, without direction, and they will kill you. They will die for meaning. This is, this is, uh, there's Persh there. There's the fire. Uh, that's Forrestal. This is a guy that I love, who, if you're in the program, Thomas Merton, and uh, beyond, we're going to talk about. But it's fun for, it'll be fun for you to do one of those things, because we, Tolstoy talked about this. We're born into a world, and it's kind of given karma, the conflicts, and they're very interesting now. I think the world's coming apart, as we recently saw in Paris, in a very bizarre way, and it's affecting everyone in this room. We kind of went through the 60s and when it was all love and peace, and now the reality that people will kill you, and they're not going to go away, and we didn't necessarily do anything to cause it. They, these things will keep, keep going in our lifetime. Uh, I, I um, uh, when we, I've, I've been in academic medicine and teaching all my life, and uh, one of the ways we teach was we watched movies because there's nothing more boring than the DSM, whatever it is. <laughs> uh, if you, it's just like a root canal, uh, <laughs> mem memorizing that stuff and then regurgitating it, and then, then they say you know something, um, but. 
films are wonderful and and the because of, that's probably where the most money is that's where the most education is these are three films i highly recommend and if you had to pick one of them i would pick behind the lines with jonathan price which is probably the best discussion of ptsd on film that i know uh, in the Valley of Elah didn't get a lot of press, but it was a wonderful film about the recent wars we're having and how the basic value system of taking care of our buddies is breaking down. I highly recommend that one. And then uh, there's a French film trilogy, uh, Rouge, Blanc, and, and Bleu, I can't say it, but uh, it's really good with Juliette Binoche about how we reinvent, life will hurt you. I don't know if y'all figured that out yet, but uh, write that down if you're making notes. <laughs> and that's not so important as what we do when that happens. And these Red, White, and Blue are great films about reinventing ourselves, rediscovering love and patience and, and a reason to be. Uh, and I also wanted to mention this. We, we are going to get to 12 steps, I promise. Probably not to the second half of it. <laughs> I do want to mention this article um, and, and Google it and pull it up. It's the post-traumatic stress surprisingly positive flip side. It's in the New York Times but you can Google it and, and bring it up. It ain't all bad. You can't say that, you know, really, particularly when we're building for it. But uh, th there's some good things about being hypervigilant. There's some good things that, about really appreciating life, appreciating, you know, the, the, and I think it's true, the second best feeling in the world is being shot at and missed. And all of us, in a way, that get in these rooms, we were talking, I was talking to somebody earlier, you know, we don't get in this business because our life's on a roll, do we? No, no I saying, I'm, my life's really great, I'm going to go become a therapist. No. Uh, we're, we're trying to heal some part of us. And um, I, I highly recommend that. One of the sub-arguments that he makes in that article is that we overindulge children now. Uh, that, that Hannah Rosen has written a, an excellent little paper about how we try to make life too safe. It's my understanding they've taken jungle gyms away from playgrounds. Um, you know, and, and I, you know, if you make an argument that's a bad idea, you're saying, well, you're for hurting children, no. That's not the, the point. It's that life has a certain risk about it, and we need to learn to deal with our boo-boos and kind of get beat up. Um, an another thing that's happened is everybody gets a, a chance to score now. Uh, I've, I've got grandchildren. I've watched them grow up, and they're in Michigan, but it's kind of everybody gets to carry the ball, and no, there's no losers. Well, that's not really true. And, and when you finally get out into the workplace to find out then, or on the fields of Afghanistan, it's not a time to find that out. <laughs> you want to find that out when you're six and seven, is that some people are bigger and some, you know. And, uh, anyway, that's uh, another thing. The, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about Sir Adrian Cardin de Wart. This is one of those people I would have just loved to have met. Um, and Edmund Burke, who said, for many people, and this has been my experience, I'm embarrassed about it, but it's true, a war is the time of their lives, it ex exacts an attraction so appalling it exhilarates. And, and I, I, I'm sorry about that, but that's true. And Burke said that. Uh, this is Sir Adrian Paul Carton de Wart, Victoria Cross, Knights of the British Empire, I won't read them all, but a British Army officer who served in the Boer War, World War I, World War II, was shot in the face, head, stomach, ankle, leg, hip, and ear, survived two plane crashes, tunneled out of a POW camp, bit off his own fingers when the doctor refused to amputate it. Describing his experience, he said, frankly, I enjoyed the war. <laughs> it's my kind of guy. <laughs> But it's true, and I think to empower people to say that is help. It's not, I'm sorry, 
Am, am y'all getting just 50 percent of this or so? Okay. The, 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 what I'm saying is that it's important to empower people to say candidly that life is very painful and we do get boo-boos along the way and we do get bumps in the road and yes you have to grieve it you know one of the things we do as therapists is witness the suffering there's a thing in in um, uh, Kohut talked about that uh, the client is stuck until they feel adequate empathy until they feel you really understand how bad it was for them they're caught and I think there's some truth to that I know in my training analysis I told my analyst that that he hadn't adequately understood me <laughs> and that, that I was stuck and he said uh, I said I was still depressed he said it's it's true, Dr. Smith, you're still depressed, but I fail to differentiate your depression from a 40-year pout. <laughs> Exceptionally cold. But there is part of us that does need to say how bad it is and hear that. But shortly thereafter, or soon thereafter, or at some time after that, we need to say you can grow with this that our darkest secrets can enable us to help countless others, that our greatest pain can, can help us. And, and I, I don't know anybody, do you know who Max Cleland is? Senator from Georgia, you, there's a picture of him, and he lost three of his four limbs up at Quezon. And he has taught me more about PTSD than anyone because he really delights in being alive every day. It's not that he denies how bad it was, but he is so grateful to be alive and has really recovered those emotions that make life worth living, which are awe, wonder, gratitude, laughter, spontaneity. I think if the program gives us anything, it gives us that if we work it. He's a good looking guy, wasn't he? I'll revisit this, and again, my views do not represent the Department of Defense, the Department of the Navy, Freud, uh, Bill Wilson. They're just, you know, wh what I've come to understand. He knew that the essence of war is violence and moderation in war is imbecility. Now, let me expand on that. By my value system, we go to war too quickly. We get involved in wars we should not have any business being into and that's a belief system I can't prove any of that and then certainly those decisions are made with more intel than I, I have but when my father got on an LST down in San Diego in World War II to go invade Japan he knew when he was coming home he was going to come home when they got to Tokyo and nobody court-martialed him for wiping out a village. They knew that war involved destruction of the enemy's capacity to wage war and his will to wage war. That Nagasaki and Hiroshima, when, when Truman uh, the, the estimated that it saved two million lives at a minimum, and they asked him if he anguished about it, he said, I slept like a baby. It was the right thing to do. Now, I'm not making a value system judgment. I'm saying that when you go to war, you have to go to war and destroy the enemy and destroy the enemy's capacity and will to fight. What we do now, it seems to me, that we'll, we're just going to take one tank in one town and only kill six people. And that causes more rage and more reactivity than I think we did during World War II. The bombing of Dresden was done with intent to destroy Germany's will to, to fight a war. And we're good friends with them now. We're great friends with Japan. And I think when you have to go to war, you go to war, but you don't do the ridiculous things we do now. The day I 
retired and I was, um, you know, it's one of those emotional things that a couple of things happen. In the Navy, they pipe you aboard, pipe you ashore, do you do the boatswain's whistle. And, and I was getting on the elevator and there was a young Marine there and missing his right arm, his right leg in a wheelchair. And I said, Corporal, thanks for going into harm's way. What happened? He said, well, Captain, I was in a, it was a rifle team in Fallujah at dusk and we were patrolling and I thought, what in the hell are you doing at dusk in Fallujah patrolling? I can understand wiping, I can understand wiping out Iraq, but to patrol uh, on that, and that is the kind of, I, I share more than you'll want to hear about me, that is the frustration I have experienced since I didn't go to Canada uh, in Vietnam. We keep doing these chicken shit wars and not winning them, and they court-martial us if we sit, shoot too many people. And it's, it's a breakdown of meaning at such a primary level. You guys are going to inherit more PTSD. That's the bottom line. Okay. So forgive me for that rant. Um, I want to mention Hunter. Did, I, I taught emergency medicine out at Riverside General Hospital, and we had a medicine residency out there that was uh, fun. Did anybody from Riverside or know anything about Riverside General Hospital? They do more gunshot wounds than any city, any county hospital in the area. We had a head of security there named Hunter. I don't know if he's still alive, but. In those days, people would take PCP a lot. Anybody been in an emergency room, seen anybody toxicated on PCP? They, I mean, they break restraints. It's, it's the scariest thing in the world. Hunter had been in Korea, and um, he had volunteered in Vietnam to be on the LERP, the long-range reconnaissance platoons. They would go out in the night to find the VC and wait for him. And Hunter, when he, he had a presence about him that I just, you just wanted to hang out with him. Somebody could be on PCP, breaking restraints, and Hunter would walk in the room and everything would get very quiet. And I asked him a couple of times, because he had such a peace about him, I said, what in the hell were you doing in Vietnam volunteering to be out there three years in a row in a war that didn't have any? He said, hell, Doc, I like it. I liked it in Korea. He said, I was 17, I had a 50 caliber machine gun, and it was very, very cold. And he said, you could smell the garlic and know that the Chinese were coming. And he said, I'd just be sitting there, and I liked it. Now, Hunter did not come here and beat his wife. He had a great humor, great emotional reciprocity, was a wonderful human being to get to be around. And he was an example to me of a person that does not have to be destroyed by PTSD, that he could do his duty, which was violent, and come back and feel fine and be a good dad, take his kids to football, yell at his wife only twice a year. Great guy. And he was an example to me, and I've been studying this because I've seen the others get in more trouble with it. And, and I think that that kind of message doesn't get out as much. What is PTSD? A disruption of the steady state of being. This is mine. It's a sustained hypervigilant anxiety disrupting emotional reciprocity, attention, spontaneity, and trust. That's kind of a big thing. And then the last one is a treatable emotional state disrupting work, love, and play. And the good news about it is it's treatable. The bad news is it does tend to aggravate us, I think, the rest of our life. I, I like this. That's, that's Kierkegaard. That's why everybody in this room has got PTSD. You've all been there. 
And it is the worst trauma we ever experience. If you can think of that, um, the, the, Otto Rank called it the trauma book. Beckett talks about it in Malloy. Uh, Camus, the absurd, and Kierkegaard talks about we're thrown into a universe. I mean, suddenly we're here. Why wasn't I consulted? Uh, none of us will ever experience, probably, and I, I used to, when I was at Riverside, you know, Interstate 15 comes up that interior, and for a while, if you got into this country and had a baby, you, the baby became a citizen and so did you. I think the immigration laws have changed now. But it was rare that I would go through a shift at Riverside General Hospital and not catch one of these little babies uh, from a mama with no prenatal care. And uh, that's why I really like this picture because this baby had come from not being cold, from being warm, not being hungry, you could pee if you wanted to. I mean, it's a total quiet to that kind of disruption. And everybody has, has been there. Um, Balin talks about that basic disruption of the separation from the uterus as, uh, as the basic fault, that we all have it that we try more or less successfully the rest of our lives to repair that disruption. Durrell, the great the guy who wrote the says about us that there is in all of us a great unhealed place. Now the addict tries to fill that void. I think that's what we try to do with beer or alcohol or sex or whatever it is. And you can't do it. That's the problem is I couldn't drink enough. <laughs> because that condition of being ultimately alone in the universe. Each of us is condemned to a life of solitary confinement in our skin. Freud's oceanic feeling. Jung has that beautiful line. Anybody seen Carl Jung's letter to Bill Wilson? It's beautiful. He said that it's a that spiritual thirst for wholeness that the alcoholic has. Balint, uh, the sexual experience is really that the orgasm is one of those few moments that we have where we don't have a sense of the separate self and we lo lose the experience of time. And it kind of repairs that, but it's momentary. Uh, the creative process um, Balint felt like it was the origin of addiction and the origin of perversions, Freud said. What causes PTSD? A disruption of the basic trust, the losses of a sense of justice, a cohesive self, and meaning. Um, we, I'll, I'll revisit this in a minute. How are y'all doing for time? Do you want to break or you want to go on for another? Pardon? Okay, okay, okay. I get tired of me in another ten minutes, so we'll we'll break then. <clears throat> that there was an attention. I don't know if any of y'all are old enough to remember the little boy or the midwife movement. Uh, there was a recognition that, and, and I think that's true, that being born in a hospital is really difficult, and there's probably a better way to do it. I don't know about this medical center, but a lot of the uh, medical centers have gotten a lot more quiet and music, perhaps, and dark in a room so that this infant doesn't come quite into the world. The, the way that with the steel and the bright lights, it's about as bad as you can come up with. Now, Melanie Klein talks about, and I'm going to talk, now we're just going to talk a little bit about uh, how we begin to think and what Beyond called the apparatus for thinking, because I think it's that is the thing that's disrupted in PTSD. So to do that, to see what is disrupted, let's talk about how we put into our brain an apparatus for thinking thoughts. Is that more or less, okay. If I get, uh, you know, if we need to slow down or clarify, just, just yell at me. Melanie Klein says that we all start out in a paranoid position, that that's the, the, the 
we're all basically paranoid at the core. Why? Because of this birth. Because we're utterly helpless. Because it is a psychotic situation, really, that you realize you're in this world, no instruction manual, certainly most vulnerable that you'll ever be, totally helpless, dependent upon the goodwill of the other, or M-O-T-H, out there. She called it the paranoid uh, position of emphasis. All of the, the Greek mythology supports her. Cronus uh, has his babies, and then he eats them, and it's really bad, man. Uh, that is Melanie Klein writ large. The truth of Melanie Klein's on the bathroom walls. Eat me. That fear that we are so vulnerable we could be food. And the, the Greek mythology backs that up. She says the next thing that happens to us as we develop a little bit is the depressive position. We realize we're here and we realize how utterly dependent we are on the goodwill of others. We're totally helpless and if nobody loves us, we're screwed. Anybody in here got a little abandonment anxiety? I do. This is what she said was the depressive position. This is why relationships are so smooth in early recovery. <laughs> Aware of our helplessness, powerlessness, and agency and autonomy. What, what does that baby need? That baby needs a sense of autonomy, a sense of agency, a sense of hope, emotional reciprocity. It really does need to pay peekaboo with the mama and the caregiver. Really does need to learn that it can smile and see a face smile back. Basic trust, a cohesive self, and a capacity to soothe itself. A capacity to deal with life even though it's not picked up and had the needs met immediately. So, and there's a lot more than that, but that's kind of where I start out. The baby needs to be picked up in hell. The baby needs to be told what it's feeling. Baby cries, and the mother says, you're hungry. The baby cries, the mother says, you're, you're tired, you need a nap. Baby cries, the mother says, oh, you just need a hug. What happens in an alcoholic home? Who's the baby in the alcoholic home? the alcoholic. So the baby kind of grows up, everything's jump ball. What the hell am I feeling? That's the brilliance of the program of HALT. You remember? Don't get too hungry. Why did they say that? Because I didn't know. When I got sober, I didn't know what the hell I felt. I felt bad is what I felt. And I remember I was in Corona Del Mar, and it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I was sober about 2 years there was a Sunday night meeting and I felt bad and I realized I identified the affect as loneliness it was the first time I had separated that from hunger or anger or whatever else I was feeling why is it important to be able to name the affects and that's what we do as therapists we help people name the affects not naming them is a condition called alexithymia the inability to put feelings into words. Why is that important? Because if you realize, once I recognized I was lonely, I could either go to a meeting or go home and deal with my solitude, but not drink over it. And a lot of what we do as therapists is just help people put a name on what they're feeling. As an ER doc, or you know, people would come in and the emergency room and say, "Oh my, I'm, I feel like I'm going to die. My, my my heart's beating and I'm." I can't breathe and I'm feeling, and you do an EKG and do the other stuff that's $1,200 and then you say, you got panic disorder. And they say, oh, that's what it is. You hadn't done anything but name it, but they feel better. And when we can name our affect states, we can then begin to do something about it. And that's the brilliance of the 12-step programs because the sponsors say, you call and say, guys, it's terrible. Did you eat yet? Oh. And it's a chance to grow up again because we're, if you grew up in an alcoholic home, you, you haven't had those needs met. 
how do we get what we need the primary maternal preoccupation and you've seen that with new mothers that they can the baby can be in the other room and uh, turn over in bed and the mother will know to go up there and it's how we communicate like that I, I don't know uh, primary maternal preoccupation food heat comfort skin to skin contact and holding uh, Emotional reciprocity, frustration, we, we talked a little bit about this. The emotional thermostat, I think, in most people is set um, pretty early. Uh, mine is set on despair and hopeless dread. <laughs> I, 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 I wake up in the morning and it's say, oh, no. Uh, <laughs> now, I, I, I've... I've married different folks over the years, and uh, I'm on a personal best now, 18 years. But she wakes up and she's happy, and I don't understand that. <laughs> what we can do, though, with therapy and with the program is learn to reset our emotional thermostat. That Abraham Lincoln was probably right. Most people are as happy as they make up their mind to be. That I'm responsible for what I'm looking at today and how I'm feeling. It's a huge leap forward. The emotional thermostat and what breaks is continuity, the steady state, the assumption of being. Now, th that's out of the, you know who that guy is? Yeah. Either I was right on about him or, or uh, the others are, I don't think he, Anyway, we, we could do a lot worse than having that guy in power in Syria. I'll just put it that way. This is more than you want to know. Huh? <laughs> the uh, guy I travel with, uh, Arlen Specter, believed that you get close to everybody, that you keep your enemies, you keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. That's a really strange guy. That's down at CERT. This, the reason I bring him up, and he's got PTSD. I have never seen a more paranoid, anxious, evil person than this guy. This is where we went out to see him. He uh, had about 14 of these um, after Reagan nearly got him with an F-14. Uh, he, no one ever knew where he was going to be at night, but uh, very strange guy. Very strange guy. But again, and this is more politics than you want to know, when he was in power, there wasn't an al-Qaeda problem in Libya. It's now a failed state, and it's awful. And I was in Tripoli, and you could get a cup of coffee, and it was kind of fun. But not now. So every, I think over the 24 years that I've been in and out of these parts of the world, every time we could make a decision, we made the wrong one. It's a shorthand. Uh, okay, no, that's not. Uh, you know about the comorbidities, 50% mor morbidity with alcohol, 35% drug abuse, drug dependence, self-medication, 60-80% of Vietnam veterans seeking treatment for PTSD have alcohol disorders. I don't, these statistics, I don't know, but you, you see it. We've all got trauma, and some of us have taken drugs and alcohol for it. This is my, I tell you what, let's, can we quit for 10 minutes? Because I'm tired of me. And uh, we'll come back, well, about five minutes, and we'll come back, and we'll wrap up and have some questions. Thank you all for your being here. Good. So we'll we'll try to end in about 20 more minutes and 20 to 25 minutes, and then open it up for discussion. We've got until 11:30. Is that what it is? But that's a long time, isn't it? <laughs> let's, let's just get our CMEs and get out of here. Um, the. the the area that I've 
been concentrating on the most probably because it's my own neurosis is uh, midlife growth. It's and, and those of you that are in the treatment business, the thing that was exciting for me about addiction and alcohol, and I had gone, I, I, I had all, gone all the way through medical school, a crit, uh, internal medicine residency, a critical care fellowship, and had never seen anybody in recovery. And I can't tell you how scary that is to have alcoholism. I was the first physician actually trained in critical care medicine in the federal system and had the ICU at Portsmouth, which was the largest. Half the people in, if we go across the street to Torrance, to the ICU there, half the people in any ICU will be there because of addiction, either smoking or drinking too much or food. And to have addiction and not see any a recovery was really terrifying. And when I got to the Navy's program, and I remember in Long Beach, that door opening up and seeing 90 people in recovery, it was like seeing a, a Petri dish with colonies thriving. It was just, uh, I, I was, it took my breath away. And I feel so blessed to have a fatal illness that's treatable, that's fun to treat. Did you ever think about that, if any of you that are in the program, and, and to watch that? And, and it's really interesting what happens to folks when they get in recovery. It's not so interesting, the drinking stuff, the drunk log, they drank here, drank there, drank under the Christmas tree. Who the hell cares? But what happens when you get into recovery? This young man, uh, uh, veteran, that talked to me earlier said, Doc, I'm... Uh, I want to get involved in this. I'm three and a half years sober. A good guy, very sharp, very smart. And in my experience, in that three to five years is when you have to go back and become uh, what you were supposed to be. And I was a shrink. I was terribly embarrassed about it, uh, being a psychiatrist. In fact, I, when I told my dad I was going to leave critical care medicine and become a psychiatrist, he said, that's such a shame, son. You're such a good doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but but it, it's really, you have to, you know, I was at the Naval Academy in the 60s, and they were, at Berkeley, they were smoking dope and screwing around, and I, I, that's where I wanted to be, and I was off going to war. And uh, so it, the closest I could do to that in recovery is become a shrink. You know, it's we get to think ideas and have all kind of feelings and be, you know, perverse in our thinking, and it's just terrific. <laughs> What happens, though, in recovery is we have to go back and deal with our family of origin issues. Uh, very few people get per perfect parents, you know. At this, I grew up in a Tennessee Williams play uh, with big daddy and southern hysteric seductive aunts and women, and it was wonderful. I wouldn't trade that now. I couldn't think of anything worse than growing up with a normal family. But it takes a while to get there, and that's part of the work of recovery. Once you get into recovery, you have to go back and do that. And I think get angry with them and then love them. You know, you have to go. Family of origin issues has a statute of limitation. You know, I, I know a lot of people, well, if my had been held more. I, uh, I told my mother once, I said, if you'd breastfed me, I'd turned out better. And she said, don't be silly. You have to grow up, you know, and most of us in this room know how to work. That's the way you become a therapist. Most of the people I see in the Senate or House or in the Pentagon know how to work. They're really good at it. Freud said that what mental health is the ability, Arbeitenden Leben, the ability to work and to love. It's a little more complicated than that. It also involves the capacity to play. Very complex activity, very important in the second half of life. It's hard to learn. You can only you can't learn it in an alcoholic home. You learn to play when you feel safe. And if you grow up in an alcoholic chaotic home, you're trying to feel safe. You're not. You know, play's not on the uh, horizon. But I AA and therapy have a lot more to do with play than work. We talk about working our program, screw that. Have a good time.
go to a meeting, have some coffee, tell stories. It's not a lot more complicated than that. But that is a very important learned activity. Um, and I would add that to mental health, that it's the capacity to work, love, and play. Now, Jung said, it, Jung has another definition of mental health, and I should mention it because he's so important in our 12-step heritage. He said that mental health is the capacity to hold opposites in the head at the same time, opposite feelings. As alcoholics, we want it to all be one way or the other. We're ad addicted to perfection. He gives an example. In fact, George Valiant, who wrote a book, uh, Adaption to Life, he, A Natural History of Alcoholism. He's in uh, Al-Anon for many years. He was at Harvard. He gives him an example. He did a greatest study. It was a study of 100 graduates of Harvard. And it was one of those studies you wish you'd thought of. When he got admitted to Harvard, he said, look, I'm here with the best and brightest. I'm going to follow them every five years for, six, for as long as I live. And he's done that study. It's called the Harvard study, the Cambridge study, and interviewed people over 50 years. And I think it's now like 70 years. The thing that's correlated the best with mental health, you know what it is? The capacity to stay married. It made me very nervous because I hadn't <laughs> been able to do that. But he asked one of the wives of one of these 100 guys. One of the 100 was John Kennedy, but he you know, was lost to follow up because of his assassination. But he asked one of the wives of one of these guys if she had ever thought about divorce. She said, divorce never, murder daily. <laughs> he gives that as an example of mental health, because part of the time you just want to shoot one another. But it's not mental health to do it. But it's also probably not mental health to not acknowledge it. So we hold those opposites in the head at the same time and go on and keep the commitment. So that, I love that definition of mental health, of Jung, is the capacity to have opposites in the head at the same time. Now this is what I think happens to us when we get to these 12 steps, when we finally, uh, it's the last house on the block, and I think that's where it works the best. If I had another self-help book to read, I'd probably read it, and I'd written up myself a prescription for every way I wanted to feel. And um, you know, it, none of that had worked. And by the time I walked in my first AA meeting, and it was the 7th of December, 1976, in Long Beach, east side open door, and I hadn't had a drink since, 38 years, and that's a gift, and the gift was that I was blessed from the start by loving whatever it is we do in those rooms, and I'm not sure it's a lot more complicated than we tell stories to one another, we hold hands, and we leave. That need to do that, you know, for 500,000 years, at night we gathered around the fire with those little hunter-gatherer groups, 10 males, 10 females, 20 children, and told stories to one another. 500,000 years that we think we did that. We told, told stories about how to find breakfast and not be breakfast. And because we discovered condos, that need did not go away, or iPhones for that matter. We still need to talk with one another. We still need to tell our story. We ne still need to hear it, and we need to tell it. And I think that's the great, one of the great hopes of civilization. I'm pretty pessimistic, but we're still uh, getting in these rooms and talking to one another. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. That is true. And that is when you, you start with truth. It allows you to be receptive. It's that baby letting its guard down a little bit to let something in. Becoming teachable, becoming pliant. We now know that the brain, you know, they, what, they're doing a lot of thanks to Arlen Specter, who I worked with for 22 years, uh, increased the NIH budget 20-fold because he believed in this stuff. And now they're looking at the brain and what happens to people that go to meetings. And guess what? Your amygdala gets bigger. 
that part that's the affiliation, just by going to meetings and being with one another. And we're now look, knowing a lot more about neuroplasticity, that the brain does come roaring back. You know, alcohol, the, the thing that alcohol does is it d dissolves fat tissue. It dissolves your brain. There's some other organs that are fatty, like the testis, and that's kind of bad, man. <laughs> and I was a short guy. I need all the help I could get. <laughs> Guess what? If you go to those damn meetings, that comes back, too. The brain comes back. We didn't know that. But they just admitting we were powerless and coming around others. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. It's hope. Hope is really kind of important. I think you kind of have to take all three steps at once. I'm powerless. I, see, I saw some evidence that people got better, and I made a decision to turn my life and my will over the care of whatever was in those rooms. If there was a different room or a different self-help book, I said I, I would have done that. But I think they kind of have to happen together, and it happens within. You know, people that are resistant to the program, I've never known to, what words to say to make people like AA. You just have to be hurting enough, I think, to be teachable. What the big book says, sweetly reasonable is only the dying can be. But to be receptive that there is another way. And when that happens, uh, we, develop, we begin to develop basic trust, a willingness to risk. And as I said, the scariest walk I ever made was from that white Navy van into that east side open door in Long Beach. I don't know what that was about. But if you ask people, they'll tell you that. It is terrifying to come in here. And I think it's really we're afraid of joining the human race and really finding out who we are deep down within. Letting down the guard. Made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. That has to do with truth, responsibility, agency. If you make a list, you feel like you're doing something. And AA is genius at that. They'll take the schizoid guy that, you know, is back here like this, and they'll make him the greeter. And the kind of outgoing, loudmouth like me, they'll put him back and say, you make the coffee. But there is a genius about the way that that unfolds, and you'll see it. That, that kind of therapy you can't buy. You also begin to develop, for the first time sometimes, an ego-observing capacity. You begin to say, no, I did this. I really did push my wife. I really did have an affair. It's not something I'm pushing back. And then admitted to God, to ourselves, and another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. That is really, if intimacy, and this is a good definition of intimacy, I think, it's sustained vulnerability without defensiveness of being open. It is the beginning of intimacy for most people, the fifth step. And I remember, I, you know, it's, it's I've... One of the things I do in my practice is I hear fifth steps. I, I love this St. John Vianney. Uh, he was a priest that had trouble getting through his academics and was really supposed to be the greatest guy to hear confession. And I, I really love that. I'm, I'm an agnostic Buddhist Jew who loves Christ. But um, uh, I love hearing fifth steps. And they're all the same. Most of us have made love to or thought about making love to something we shouldn't along the way. And we need to talk to somebody about that. That, and, and I could, when I did that, and I found a sergeant major in the Marine Corps, and I wrote down the stuff about me I didn't want to tell anybody, and I could see the acceptance in his eyes. I could begin to internalize that. That is the power of AA, I think. It's the power of 12-step. It's also the power of therapy. You know, when somebody says, I you know, think about making love to a giraffe tied upside down. You say, uh huh. <laughs> what else? <laughs> it's healing. We become part of the human race. Um, again, basic trust. Six and seven, we're entirely ready to have God remove these defects of character. Again, the powerness, trust, intimacy, and the plasticity. When we become ready, humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. Again, that's openness. I think we begin to open to the world. 
made a list of all persons we had harmed, became willing to make amends to them all, treats projection and blaming. The addictive triad is projection and blaming and denial. And when you begin to make a list of the people we had harmed and to see our action, we begin to limit those very primitive de defenses of projection and blaming. You see that in, uh, I, I'm politically very incorrect, but you see that with the Islam fundamentalists right now, maybe us toward them too, that they're blaming us for everything, therefore we will kill you. And we reached out to Osama a number of times and the message always came back that we don't want to talk to you, we want to kill you. And it's very, they're very serious about it and very committed to it. But when you're, the, the difference between envy and jealousy, if, if you're jealous about somebody, you want what they have, uh, but you don't want to destroy them for having it. Envy, again, Melanie Klein said, is the most toxic emotion. And we want to kill you for your capacity to have things we don't know how to develop. And you're seeing that internationally, I think, in a tremendous way. Reduces the paranoid position of infancy. Made direct amends to such persons, except when to do so. Restores a sense of justice, which is what PTSD, that little baby, if that little baby doesn't get held and is in a abuse situation or in an alcoholic home, it knows that that's not fair. And what the ninth step does is it begins, you begin to restore a sense of justice because you behave in a just way. It's sometimes the first sense that we get of that. Restores agency, autonomy, and ability to respond. Ten continued to take a personal inventory. Treats the disease of the ability to relate to others. Restores integrity agency. Reduces the depressive position because you're out there now. You're out there doing what George Bernard Shaw said. Uh, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to get out of that it's a pre-verbal thing I was at a meeting at Yale and saw the EEG changes and the skin resistant changes I was uh, just enchanted with the physiology around meditation it's it's very worthwhile to look at those of you that are interested in the brain and brain chemistry but it changes in a profound way um, I put some books there Zen mind beginners mind Zuki and uh, the continuity that we experience with meditation and again the amygdala gets better the nucleus accumbens these the physiologic structures get better and bigger and fatter and healthier just by sitting down and counting your breath or doing the St. Francis of Assisi prayer. It doesn't seem to matter what you do. The Zen folks uh, seem to d get the biggest changes. That's why I went to Zen Monastery in Kyoto. Uh, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholic and practice these principles in all our affairs. Ericksonian generativity. We, we, people in this room are not in here because of money. There's a lot better ways to make money. Y'all are in here because you're trying for generativity. You want things to be a little better. You want to be keepers of the truth. You have done what George Bernard Shaw says. It's the real cause. It's in the, uh, that introduction to Mrs. Warren's profession. So this is the true joy of life. To lose yourself to a cause determined by yourself to be a mighty one. To be used up before they put us on the scrap heap of life. To become a force in the universe rather than a sniveling little clod of grievances, ailments, and insecurity complaining that the world does not devote itself to making us happy. You can just hear him do that. And that's what you've done. And you ought to get kudos for this does not have PTSD. Hypnotic, wonderful guy. Very idealistic, bad guy. Let's quit and have any, any questions or comments. Any? Hold on, let me bring the mic. 
I'm curious if you've seen any research on the power of touch in healing. You know, maybe in the rooms, it's the hug, it's the handshake, it's it's the holding the hands. It's I don't know. Have you seen anything? God bless you. I'm not intelligent enough to talk about, and I don't think it's been measured, the amount of oxytocin that you get released. But it's, there was a Time magazine or something about the love hormone. But when we hug each other, we feel better. And one of the problems in this culture now is most of the sexual activity now in this culture is online. It's you're relating to electrons, really. <laughs> and the price of that is we don't get the oxytocin. And that's a great thing. Some We were talking to Rochelle. I'd forgotten. I hugged everybody that came up here. You know, and I'm a, I just love it. And there's, not, there's no substitute for that. Touch therapy is really, we're, we're a culture that's starved for affection, I think. And that's somehow probably why... Uh, some of the perverse stuff happens in our culture. It comes out toward children or, or others that are inappropriate because we just don't hug each other enough. Great question. It's oxytocin the main one. There's some others. The endorphins get released, but I'm not enough of a neuropsychopharmacologist to be specific about it. But sure, it's a great question, and I think it's why the program works as much as anything else. Yes, sir. Let me bring a mic so you can hear. Hold on. Hold on. What's your take on medications? Uh, PTSD. Well, God bless you. I, I, that's another talk. I'll be doing that at the West Coast Substance Abuse. I think that we've got great medicines. I think we overuse the hell out of them in this culture. We, we, we take two-thirds of the antidepressants in the world. We have more Americans living alone, 27% than any other culture. I don't think that's unrelated. We've got good medicines. We overuse them. The name of the talk is what are we medicating in recovery? I think most of the time we're medicating separation, individuation issues, and feelings that we aren't naming. And most of the stuff, is sometimes you need it. And sometimes it can be very valuable. But I think we prescribe too much and use too much. I don't know if that's of help to you. Yes, ma'am. Beginning in treatment, uh, how long, uh, through your experience, does it take to begin um, getting more well from PTSD and drug abuse? <laughs> Well, I, that's a great question. How long does it take to start getting better? Um, in general, I think people start getting better pretty quick. The more meetings they go to, the the I look like the, my, my percep the way I'm perceived as a psychiatrist is directly related to the number of meetings my patients go to. If they go to a lot of meetings, they say, "Boy, he's smart." If they don't go to any meetings, say, uh, he's not so hot. Uh, I think we start getting better. I started getting better from the first. From the first time I walked in an AA meeting, uh, within about five minutes, I felt like my life might make it. And I think it's a, a trajectory beyond that, and I'm still getting better. I don't think we ever get well. Right here. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Dr. Captain. Um, I am asking about EMDR. Are you familiar with it, and what's your take on it? I'm familiar with it, and I think anything that makes people feel that they have some control of their life and their affect state will work. And it's just, there's a wonderful, I think it's very powerful in good hands. And I, 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 again, I don't do it. I'm not intelligent enough to say how it works. Or, or the uh, double-blind studies, but I think like uh, acupuncture, uh, the, I, I refer you to a paper called The Power of Nothing by Ted Kupchak. Ted Kupchak's a very interesting guy. He's chairman of the Department of uh, Medicine at uh, MIT that looks at study, that designs studies, designs uh, double-blind studies, and he's a 
he doesn't have a PhD. I love that about MIT. They give guys jobs like that. He's an acupuncturist. And he knows that most studies show that double-blind studies, that acupuncture is not any better than placebo, but Kapchuk knew that his patients got better. And basically, what you believe in will work. And if a veteran that believes in, in eye movement therapy believes it'll work and the therapist does, they'll get better. Exposure therapy is the same way. Cognitive behavioral therapy is the same way. Analysis works. I came to Freud through AA, and I just love it. It comes together uh, for me fine. Right here. Yes, sir. Hi, doctor. Uh, could you talk a little bit about DBT? Dialectical behavioral therapy? I think it's wonderful. And I've tried to learn a little bit about it because I, lo I love folks that are kind of all over the place. And I think, you know, that that's kind of what we, the way life is. We all have dialectical behavioral therapy every day. And I was so glad Marsha Linehan put words to it. I don't consider myself an expert, but I think certainly in borderline personality problems, and all of us got a little borderline. I, I've got terrible twos, I assure you, and so do you. And I think dialectical behavioral therapy in good hands is just terrific, particularly with, with PTSD stuff. We'll take a couple more. And, yes, ma'am. You were talking about Freud and violence and people as the natural tendency. What do you think about the movement in Washington Marianne Williamson in particular, about establishing a Department of Peace. Well, there's, there's a huge, gorgeous building right by the Kennedy Center. I don't know if you've seen it. That's the Institute of Peace. Um, the downside is minimal. The upside would be marvelous. Uh, uh, I... I think I'm more pessimistic than I probably should be because of my life experience, but uh, that's for young folks like you to get it, get up and running. Because we love is more powerful than hate. That's <laughs> that has been my experience. I've been in the rooms with some of these really bad guys, and if you sit at the table long enough, you start liking one another. We we found that at Pan Moon John with the North Koreans. And it's, uh, if you can get folks to sit there long enough, they'll start loving each other, and it, it really throws a, a quirk in the war folks. Right here. Let's take two more and we'll quit. Yes, sir. In regards to um, children that suffer from PTSD from some traumatic um, that's an incident um, incurred during childhood, and they may not be able to um, understand the 12 step, do you think it's, more difficult for them to outgrow it as children or as adults? That's a great question. What about kids? And, and th there's some children, and you read about it every day, that are just so traumatized in our culture that can't process this handing out the literature and setting up the coffee and, and the other stuff that make us heal in PTSD. Uh, I do feel like we don't spend enough money in this culture for child care. That's, uh, I've lobbied um, for different things that, and I wish I had spent more time with that. The, the, the old Soviet Union used to spend more time on child care than we did. We don't spend, we don't pay our teachers enough, and we don't spend enough uh, in child care. And a lot of that can be repaired. Some of it can't be. You see that with these Romanian orphans who, come in that uh, where they've been five, 500 with one caretaker. I mean, the, the brain just never will develop. But most of the stuff with children can be repaired in the care of good caregivers that love them enough and hold them enough. And we don't spend enough money. I don't know. I, I know that there's uh, Alateen and there's one before that, Alatot. Is it? I don't know enough to know how successful they are, but that's a great question. I think we need to pay people and teach people to love and, and care for children because we're not doing it as parents. Most of the 
uh, kids grow up in divorced homes and and uh, traumatic and uh, it's uh, that's where the money is I think for the culture is to treat it earlier with better uh, conditions better space and everything else we we pay pay our child care folks the least yes um, as a Vietnam veteran I appreciate your uh, discussion today I'm also connected with the VA for various kinds of different conditions. Um, and speaking of the VA, do you have any um, connections or have you worked with the VA considering how veterans are being treated or not treated? I, uh, I talked to the judges about compensation for PTSD uh, every three months that, that I, um, have not had a lot of uh, influence with the VA. It's uh, It's got a long way to go. I think the changes that are being made are, are the most hope I've seen now. Yes, ma'am, and this will be the last one if we can. Uh, this goes along with the question that, oh, this goes along with uh, the question that he just asked. Uh, in your experience, um, do you find that the veterans that have this post-traumatic problems, do you feel that it is aggravated or that their healing is being uh, denied them or postponed because of the way our veterans are treated and, be and also because of what the administration uh, was doing in Vietnam and now with piecemeal fighting the enemy? Yes. <laughs> One is in our Yalom life of creating, you know, dealing with being alone in the universe. We really are going to die. We really do need to create meaning in our life. Traditionally, in that meta narrative has come down in World War II, it did for me. And then when Khrushchev said, we will bury you. The problem now is we're going to wars that you can't get meaning from. What does a victory in Afghanistan look like? Nobody knows. And these kids, you, you'll die for a cause. You'll die for a ribbon on your thing. You'll, you'll die for your shipmates if there's a cause behind it. And I think the underlying loss of meaning is the problem with the PTSD. That's one of the factors. We go to wars we shouldn't be in and don't win them because we don't know what a victory looks like. The second is, is these are by and large economic conscripts. When we had selective service and everybody had to go, as this Vietnam, my shipmate back there who was Vietnam vet, he didn't have any choice. Well, you could have gone to Canada, I guess, but we were going to war. So you, you don't have people whose lives aren't working basically it's not true now because economic times have been pretty tough and, and it's now a buyer's market. People don't join the Marine Corps because their life's on a roll. They join because their family's tragic and beat up and awkward and they're unemployed or unemployable. So you got people who have been traumatized and re-traumatize them with a meaningless war and then try to write a check for that and you can't do it. If, if a Marine now comes home and says, I got PTSD, he gets, what, $800 a month tax-free the rest of his life. That's not good either. So we're lost, I think, without a rudder in national policy. And we're, you guys are seeing in your office the, the, the results of that. I wish I had clearer answers. But what I would do is not go to war unless you have to go to war. And if you go to war, win it and have selective service for everybody. Not that you have to go to war, but that you have to go in the inner city or you gotta go work on the highway or you gotta go work in the forest. I think national service would be a wonderful thing. Thank y'all for Thank being you. here. Thank you to Dr. Smith. Thanks for coming and we'll see you in two months again. Take care.